Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's episode 65 of Collider Heroes of John Schnepp. Welcome. It's a week before San Diego Con. I want to introduce our all-star panel, starting with Robert Meyer Burnett over there. What's up, Robert? How's it going? Good to be here. Very excited for San Diego. Yes. You so know, I'm a week away. What's, a, what's your highlight you're looking for? Those exclusive Hot Toys Joker oh, and Nightmare no. Batman figures. Nightmare and Batman. And the QMX Kirk and Spock 12. What the <laughs> hell is a QMX? I don't even know what that it's a is. company. Yeah. All right. They're like Hot Toys <laughs> figures, but not. Okay. As long as they're the same ratio, they fit with the other Hot they Toys. They do. All it's right. Go they can be friends. Mal from Firefly, they did a figure of. All right. QXL or whatever it was they called. QMX. Again? QMX. There we go. We love those. John Campia, what's up, man? Comic Con's next week. That's I've right. already started taking <laughs> cocaine. <laughs> Just getting prepped. That's right. He is amped and ready to go. I've never seen him more on fire. He cannot <laughs> wait. It's a week away. And right over here, we've got the lovely Ashley V. Robinson, oh, the host yeah. of Comic Book Now. What's going on? Thanks for being back. Thanks for having me back. I feel like I'm the only person who's already cried waiting for San Diego Comic Con to happen. So I'm happy for all of you. Hey, I, I, How come you cried? Because I'm a girl and I'm sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of sensitive issues. Well, the very first one is not even on the ticket here. Uh, let's let's start off with some of the Collider Heroes artwork. You guys keep sending it in, and I'm going to post it when it makes me laugh, and it's got the whole crew. We've got Macanita Silva uh, has uh, me and a uh, Yeti. I uh, <laughs> sometimes wear the uh, Yeti shirt, and uh, someone had a <laughs> Yeti wearing a naked Schnapp shirt. So thank you, <laughs> Macanita. That made me laugh. Uh, and uh, next one up, we got Vince Stone kicking off the Fantastic <laughs> Four heroes. Uh, we got me, Amy, John, and Robert. A lot of people were commenting on John Campia being naked. Uh, no, he's just on fire. And he's dancing, the human, he's and dancing, dancing, dancing. It's most naked. important that he's dancing and he's catching all of the Pokemon with his wife Anne. Oh, That's the most important start. thing. <laughs> so, Son of a bitch. Mi midnight walks with Anne. So here we go. Breaking news. We got an X-Men TV show. Can you believe that? So Fox has announced that they are going to be doing an X-Men TV series. Now, we here at Heroes were just talking about it like a couple weeks ago. Like, look, I think uh, X-Men uh, TV show would work better than a movie because you get to have all that drama and all that kind of soap opera stuff that's in all the X-Men comic books that we really loved, especially the Chris Claremont written, like, you know, 10, 15 year run that he did. Um, so uh, this guy, Matt Nix, is in charge of the pilot that they are making. They have a pilot commitment. He's writing it. Uh, he's going to be an executive producer. We got Brian Singer coming back on, uh, Laura Schuler Donner, um, uh, Jeff Loeb, all of the regulars, uh, and, uh, and Jim Corey from uh, Jessica Jones. So we've got a, a mix of people from ABC, Netflix, all the different, and the movies all coming to make this Fox X-Men series. Let me just read quickly what the uh, the outline is basically the untitled Marvel project will focus on two ordinary parents who discover their children possess mutant powers. They're forced to go on the run from a hostile government. The family joins up with an underground network of mutants and must fight to survive. It's going to be produced by 20th Century Fox and Marvel Television with 20th Century Fox handling the physical production. So I think it's like for X-Men fans, is it a dream come true? We don't know. They had announced about six, seven months ago they were doing Legion and Hellfire, now we've heard that Hellfire is canceled. So that's not happening. Legion is still floaty. I don't know if they shot a, a pilot. We don't know what it's gonna be. It's not part of the X-Men canon or X-Men movie universe. This one will probably, my guess, also not be part of the X-Men canon or universe of the movie. Uh, what are your thoughts? Let's start with you, Robert. Well, you know, I, I was actually looking forward to the Hellfire Club series mm -hmm. and it was kind of unceremoniously dumped, which sort of bums me out. but. You know, the parents going on the run with their mutant kids kind of sounds like we saw the movie Midnight Special earlier this year. Sure. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, of films like that, you know, parents taking their special children on the road. <laughs> right. Um, that sounds interesting. Uh, I don't know how that's going to fit in with the X-Men universe. I mean, why not just do a new Mutants TV series? Right. You know, I mean, that's what I... Why I not love... just make an X-Men TV series? Right, I, I don't I don't understand. I mean, I, I think making an X-Men TV series on TV, I mean, we've got the effects now that we can do it, but it, it's I think it's a hard thing to do. Why would... They, look at it this way. You're in the X-Mansion. You're at school. Mm -hmm. Why is that a hard thing to do? It's like Degrassi High with superpowers. I mean, it's like... Well, you can't do it because the X-Mansion is now the Arrow Mansion. The Oliver, it's, Isn't it Oliver Queen's house? They shoot in the same location. Oh, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. well, <laughs> budgetary restrictions besides. What do you think, John? Um, you know what? I kind of feel the same way about... Look, I, I was actually intrigued by the Hellfire Club one because I think you can almost go Breaking Bad sort of with that. You can be very dramatically driven with that. 
But I kind of feel the same way about this as I feel about Star Wars. Now, you would think as a Star Wars fanatic for life that I would be like, yes, give me Star Wars TV shows. No, I don't want a Star Wars TV show. I don't, I don't want to start watering down the perfection that is Star Wars. I don't, and look, we can say we've got the effects now. No, they don't. That, they <laughs> well, don't. Not on television, they don't. Because it's budgetary restrictions. That's why when you get things like Jessica Jones and Daredevil and uh, and uh, Cage and all that kind of stuff, you can do that because none of them need overwhelming, you right. don't need visual effects. You can make those shows for bus fare and they do such a great job of it. An X-Men show is a little bit different. So I like the idea of them separating the movie universe from television, that's a good start. But then it's going to be, I feel like it's going to be X-Men light. It's going to be watered down X-Men. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that it's going to satisfy mm -hmm. anybody. So will I be tuning in opening night to check it out? Absolutely I will. But I would, I have some extreme reservations about it. For sure. Ashley? I just don't feel super inspired by this. I like the idea of mining the X-Men universe more. And I think something like Excalibur could be different enough that it could really hone their TV universe. Sure. But... Brian Singer, New Mutants, learning that they have powers and having to run from the government. I've seen that movie six times already. <laughs> I liked it better when it was X2 than when it was uh, Days of Future Past. So I don't know. For me, there's nothing exciting about this, but maybe when more revelations come out, if it makes it to production, right. it'll seem like a fun time. You know, honestly, like, and when they said X-Men TV show, I got excited because I was like, wow, is it going to be called X-Men and it's an actual TV show? And I instantly thought Cyclops and Iceman. Yeah, and they're Beast. finally doing the thing that they should be doing. And then I read the, you know, the synopsis and it's like, no, they're not doing what they should be doing. It's another like I'm on the run. Is it like Bill Bixby and the Hulk? Only it's a family and they're in a van and there's an evil dude yeah. chasing them. And once in a while, a kid will exhibit like weird powers and like a car will explode or you know what I mean? You're right. It's the cheapo version. But honestly, I think they could do a slightly cheaper version if they did do it like a school mm -hmm. where like if you read the comic books it's not like there's explosions and mad insanity happening it's like people's interactions with each other and relationships and just like basically what a soap opera is but then occasionally stuff goes wonky and there's a, a crazy villain or a power escapes or something like that so that's what I would prefer but you know I'll wait and see I like that they're at least attempting it mm -hmm. and going a different route than making another X-Men movie I'd like to see another X-Men movie with the young crew that they introduce, like Night, Night, Nightcrawler, Cyclops, Jean Grey, but that doesn't look like that's going to happen just because of the, the way uh, Apocalypse was received and this and that. So, you know, if they're going to have to reboot it well, and do a, a TV show. Well, it's $550 million almost. Worldwide. I know, but they're, they're, they're like, look, we're going Deadpool, we got X-Force, we got New Mutants. So I don't see X-Men coming out anywhere in the next five years. And all of those new mutants that they just introduced are going to be five years older before they're they even be get... real grown up people. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, if at least if they're going to do an X-Men series, maybe they can do it, you know, right? So I'm holding out. I hope it's good. I'm going to watch it. Let's move on. We got Kid Flash. Check this out. This popped off yesterday. We got images of... Uh, Keenan Ken, Ken, Lonsdale is the actor. He's playing Wally West, and now he is actually Kid Flash in the brand new season three of The Flash TV series on CW. And then check out this other image that just popped up. This is Kid Flash with who is that guy, right? <laughs> Now, that's not Zoom, obviously. That's another dude. Now, a lot of people are saying that's that's actually the Black Racer because he showed up in some of the Flash comics. As a This is a Black Racer. is from the New Gods. Jack Kirby's the New Gods. But the artist for the comic book, Jason Fabuck, basically redrew him, and he looks almost exactly like that. So I think they took the image from the comic book version of the Black Racer, and he's possibly the new villain of season three. If that happens, that's pretty exciting. John, you, you've been watching The Flash. What are your thoughts on this? It sucks. Yeah, for real I life. love The Flash. Right. I love <laughs> it. I love season one. I love season two. Right. Um, and so I, I should, I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt moving into season three. You've all heard me talk about I love this show. I think it's great. Right. But the one criticism a lot of people often bring to it, and I've defended it up to now, is like, why is every fucking buddy in the world, pardon my language, sorry. Why is everybody in the world a speedster? Right. Every freaking character in this universe now, oh wait, you drank your coffee too hot. Speedster. <laughs> right, you know, and, when, like, and when you make all the villain speedsters, then it always comes down to a foot race, and we've already seen that twice. twice? Right. So, we've seen it twice, and now so uh, you're going to bring another character, and he's going to be speedster. And there was that, remember that girl in season two also Jessie was. Quick, yeah. had, had and she's going to have an outfit in season three. And in season three, but there was that other one that went crazy, and she became a oh, villain. Wait, and wait, wait. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, she, yeah. everybody's, you get to be a speedster, and you get, and, and yeah. I'm like. But isn't the black racer a skier? 
He not now. He <laughs> used to have. He, I mean, he was a skier. He was a new skier. Rock of ages. Yeah. I want to yeah. see a great Bond esque ski sequence <laughs> in, the, in the sky. Remember, he would ski in the sky. I know he they would. They shoot in Vancouver, so why not? There's <laughs> yeah, Whistlers I mean, come on, right let's there. Get the yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, right there. give it the benefit of the. I, I am going to give it the benefit of the doubt, but this, uh, as a f- huge fan of the show, I wanted to see them. Do something different, because you're right. It's, it, forget all the heroes that are also speedsters. Every single villain is now a speedster. It's like, come on, give us something new. Mirror yeah. Master, the Scottish, the Scottish one. Thank It'll be great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Mirror Master would be great. A lot of people look at the Flash's rogues galleries; they're like kind of cornier. But you know what? They're actually interesting and different, especially as long as they're not all running fast. It's like right, so it starts to become a little bit of the same. They're dangerous too. Yes, the Flash's rogues gallery. They, they were not like. It was not like the Adam West they Batman series. They will cut series. you. They, yeah. Will, yeah. Cut they you. will cut you. But they, they have codes of honor because Captain Cold has a code of honor that he holds all the rogues to, which is a really unique thing to the Flash's rogue gallery that like Batman villains don't have. That's right. They have mm. zero code. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of Batman villains, let's rock into our very first official topic of today. It is the Suicide Squad. That's right. So much information has dropped on the Suicide Squad. It's almost here. So after San Diego Com- Comic-Con, we have a week and a half to wait. Suicide Squad will explode across theaters all around the world with DC's third movie in their burgeoning DC I- I- expanded universe, or whatever you want to call it. Um, news has been dropping all over the web. So we've got director David Ayers talking about the Batman as a as a freaking scary creature from the P- villains POV. We've got Harley and Joker actually being in Arkham Asylum together. I think those are gonna be probably flashback sequences. We have Ayers talking about his interactions with why he actually brought Batman into the movie, why he brought Joker into the movie, and how him and Jared Leto oh, kind of had like a cat in the bag type of situation where they knew how they were gonna play the Joker. And then once Jared Leto was let loose on the rest of the crew, they're like, what the hell? He's in character the whole time. And Ayers <laughs> got to just sit back and watch. He knew what was, he didn't know what exactly was gonna happen, but he knew like, it was like, look, I know it's gonna get weird. So let's talk about Suicide Squad and some of this cool info that dropped. Ashley, what are your thoughts on it? I think it's really interesting the controversy that's coming out about Harley Quinn because everybody kind of got all up in arms about the costumes and Mm -hmm. there was a a reporter whose name I don't know who went to the set and wrote an article basically that was like, if you're a feminist and you go to the Suicide Squad set, these are the questions that you ask. And for every question that she had, which were thoughtful questions like, why is Harley Quinn dressed? not really dressed. They had really interesting answers and a lot of it came down to like, Harley Quinn is a psychological villain who uses all things, all assets uh, to her advantage. And I thought that was really fascinating and that uh, Margot Robbie also spearheaded a lot of those, which I think gives a lot of credence as to why she's getting a standalone movie before anybody else. But Harley Quinn to me is always gonna be the most interesting thing about this movie. Awesome, how about you Robert? Well, hey look, I'm fascinated by this film you know, we've heard that there's been different editorial approaches and that yep. David Ayers won out yep. his version of the film. And I, I just, I have no sense, I know what I want it to be, you know, whether it's Ballroom Blitz or whether it's <laughs> Bohemian Rhapsody, whatever it's gonna be. I mean, I don't have a sense of, I still don't know who they're fighting. Like, why has the Suicide Squad been brought together? Like, why, what is so dangerous? that they need those people, you know, mm-hmm. that Amanda Waller has to go in and put this team together. Yeah. I, I don't know, I think that's kind of interesting. I mean, we hear how, how does the Joker even fit in? Is he a part of the squad? I think he's, you know? I'll, I'll give you my guess is like, so there's also another article that came out naming the villain as the adversary, and it's gonna be a magical it's very type. very fables Yes, yeah, very, <laughs> but they're adding it, the mystical, magical elements into the DCEU with this movie, and having some very real grounded anti-heroes, these villains, fighting it. How is the how is the Joker gonna cut through? I think in the same way, scripting-wise, as the Black Panther cut through Civil War. Mm. Like, you have a storyline, A, B, and C, and you have this mad creature just cutting through the entire film yeah. and his and his goal is to get back Harley. So whatever the flashback origin sequences, they're in there. We've seen them in the trailers of her yeah. with the Joker before she becomes Harley Quinn after kind of her origin sequence, the re, the newer version of her origin se- origin sequence getting into the chemical bath turning her skin like chalk white like the Joker. So we've seen all that in the trailer. My guess is those are are flashbacks and then the Joker is like out to get 
her back. And that's, he is like a, a, like a creature of chaos, similar, but in a different way. Then probably will, f I mean, if he's facing mystical energy, his chaotic energy might be what they need they, to defeat we don't know the that. mystic powers. We gotta, they got to roll a 18 plus. That's right. You get some D&D &D rules. John, what are your thoughts the on this? The two things that really excite me about this, Ayer's approach to Batman, because he described what I think a lot of Batman fans want to see. When we see Batman in movies, what we do is we see Bruce Wayne first, and we see him thinking things through, going to the cave, getting on the computers, putting on the costume, getting in the car. So when he shows him and does this thing, we have that context. But Ayer says, think of it from the villain's perspective. He just shows up like a demon in the night, mm -hmm. breaks everybody's backs and their legs and their <laughs> ribs and puts them in the hospitals. He is a living nightmare right. to the villains. He goes, this is gonna be the first time we see Batman from the villain's perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think that's exciting. The other thing that excites me is this. I was looking at the po poster of the Joker. Think about this, Batman just took on a god from another planet and beat his ass. And yet the Joker is the one that probably haunts his nightmares. Mm. I wanna see that Joker. I wanna see the Joker that replaces a god from another planet in Batman's nightmares. Sure. And, and I think that's gonna be so cool and I cannot wait to see how they do I that. I love that take. I think also, I mean, just thinking about like a couple of the added scenes from the Ultimate Edition where from the just the TV monitor and Batman's <laughs> drops yep. off. It's yep. that kind of stuff that's like, that's how you see how real people perceive this, you know, weird creature. They don't know him as Bruce Wayne. I love that the, they let loose the the information that in Deadshot's cell, he's got like, you know, kill the bat, like all these like things because obviously Batman put, put him, him there. there. So I love those little elements. So I, I'm looking forward to it. Any final thoughts from you guys, gals? I'm just awesome. excited. I mean, <laughs> I, I think as far as the, the DC Universe, they talk about, well, Man of Steel really was the movie that launched the right. DC Universe. Now we've got Batman v Superman. Right. But this is such, to me, a, a left turn. And I want to see how it all works. I'm excited to see. In, in a different way, I mean, I was very excited to see Civil War, and it was very satisfying. Right. But this film, I really don't have a sense of it. And I'm, I'm, it's, it's almost going to be, as much as we've seen, it's almost going to be like, for the first time unwrapping a Christmas present that you actually don't know what you're getting. I am in full it's agreement. It is really the mo most exciting property of all of the DC properties because I'm not familiar with, you know, the Suicide Squad as much as all these mm -hmm. other stories. I kind of could tell you beat for beat in my mind what was going to happen with Batman v Superman. And for the most part, it did. With this, I don't know anything really about it except what the trailers have shown me. And even everything the trailers have shown me, I'm like, how does this all fit together? Right. Let's just wait and see. It's very much the opposite marketing approach to Batman. Maybe Superman. Yes. Yeah. And it's working. So Suicide Squad, let's check it out. Let's talk about scrolls, 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 <laughs> scrolls, scrolls. So James Gunn recently stated that the scrolls are co-owned by Marvel, Fox, all the different people who own anything to do with a Marvel property. They can pull out a scroll. If <laughs> if they were, it depends on which scroll characters are being used and from what story. So obviously the scrolls from the Fantastic Four can't be used, nor can the Super Scroll, also from the Fantastic Four, but the Kree Scroll War from the Avengers can be used. And the characters from those storylines, now we're cooking. We're talking about Scroll Kree. That's what we're talking about. Um, I think, is it cool that all these different companies can co-own the scrolls uh, if they want? And will this cause confusion, chaos, or sheer awesomeness? What are your thoughts? Ashley, let's I start with you. it's kind of appropriate that as shapeshifters, everybody gets a piece of them. What I want to know is who owns Hulkling, who is uh, a Skrull, and my favorite of all Skrulls. But also, as far as the cinematic universe is concerned, the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, they did the Shatari, who are the Skrulls of the Ultimate Universe. So right. if the Skrulls appear there as well, is there going to be like a, a, a Secret Wars type implosion there? Mm. Or is it going to be a different design? Like That's where, for me, it gets confusing. I think that that would be a weirder idea than having them appear across all of the, the multiverse that is the people who own the Marvel mm -hmm. properties. But like Spider-Man, it might be a cool way to tie in other properties that Marvel hasn't had a chance to touch yet, like Fantastic Four. Well, you know, could Stan Lee be a scroll? I mean, yes. everyone's talking about him being <laughs> out of the Watcher, but I'm like, yo, maybe he's a scroll. All I care about is they have those weird green ridges with the chin. They have nothing to do with the sh the Chitari. That's just the ultimate thing. A scroll is a scroll is a scroll. They have to look like that. They have to be green and have those weird ridges and stupid crowns and stuff <laughs> and pointy ears. God damn it. Robert, what do you think about well, scrolls? I love scrolls because anybody could be one. Yes. And I loved I love the secret invasion where you found out of course half the Marvel characters had been replaced for yeah, years by like scrolls. And I love that. <laughs> and I'm like, what if what if they did that? What if in one movie you find out that 
somebody has been a scroll this whole time. It's a really easy way to recast the part too. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely it is, you know, and, and I, I love it. I love the idea, I love scrolls. What do you think, John, scrolls? Well, if somebody, I explained to one friend of mine who's a little bit confused by the whole notion, what do you mean they can use, okay, so think about this, Marvel Comics have a lot of different superheroes, but not everybody can use the superheroes. Marvel can use some of the superheroes, Marvel Studios, Fox can use some of the superheroes, Sony can use some of the, think of scrolls as their own little thing. So you got scrolls, not everybody can use every scroll. Certain scrolls can only be used by Marvel. Certain scrolls can only be used by Fox. But you can use the race of the scrolls. This is something that the studios are going to have to be on the phone with each other about because this can have the potential to descend into a lot of confusion for audiences if it's not handled right. right. So I don't think what you're going to see is both Fox and Marvel go all out, look how many scrolls we have and scrolls. And have scrolls. <laughs> right. What I think will probably happen is you'll probably see James Gunn pick a scroll. I think he's going to have a character who will mm -hmm. be one of the villains. And maybe Fox at some point will have a character who is a scroll. Totally different character. But I, I don't know if in the immediate future we're going to see a, a platoon of 70 scrolls coming in here and then a, an army of 2,000 scrolls over here. I think they're going to be very selective about it. I right. think they're both going to be careful. And these, this is one of the situations where I think they're going to be in communication with each other over. Yeah, I definitely, I see the Kree and the Skrulls being a large part of whatever used to be called Infinity Wars Part 1 and 2. Mm. That is the cosmic, you know, odyssey of Marvel. They're going to not only have Guardians of the Galaxy, but they have the chance to bring in these giant different races who are battling. Mm -hmm. so. And they mentioned the Kree in Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh yeah, yes. the Cree, the Ronan, Ronan, Ronan the Accuser yeah, is a Cree. Yeah, so. so you've got, you've already got the seeds set up. Yeah, we've established war. the Cree. The Cree have shown up in Agents of Shield. So these are all characters, but we have not seen the Skrulls yet. So that's exciting, and I'm pretty sure if anyone can nail it, it's James Gunn. So I'm looking forward to his interpretation of what a Skrull looks like. Let's move on to Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman footage is going to be at San Diego Comic Con. We don't know if they're going to give us a full trailer, if they're just going to give us a couple more extended scenes, but they dropped the synopsis and it came out online uh, with uh, them uh, doing showcases for all the upcoming releases. They've released a detailed synopsis on Wonder Woman's first feature film. Here it is. Before she was Wonder Woman, she was Diana, princess of the Amazons, trained to be an unconquerable warrior, raised on a sheltered island paradise when an American pilot crashes on the shores and tells of a massive conflict raging in the outside world. Diana leaves her home, convinced she can stop the, th the threat. Fighting alongside man in a war to end all wars, Diana will discover her full powers and her true destiny. So it's directed by Patty Jenkins with script by Alan Heinberg and Jeff Johns from a story by Zack Snyder and Alan Heinberg. How does this synopsis sound to you guys? Let me start off by saying there was an original writer who wrote Pan and uh, Ice Age, his, his name was I think Fuchs. Fuchs. Um, yep. So he was announced and we were all we were like, huh, I wonder what, how, what that script's gonna be like. He's not named at all. So what probably happened was a page one rewrite because usually if even if they kept some of it, they a would last have to, minute page. Yeah, one right. Yeah. Be, yeah, possibly two weeks before the yeah. shoot or whatever. It was like a decision was made, and that we get the the that it's a story by Zack Snyder and Alan Heinberg, which is you know a little bit disconcerting considering like some of his storytelling with Sucker Punch and then with Batman v Superman, some of the story elements that didn't really work. But you know he's not an idiot, so it's like, look, you got Jeff Johns to come in and write, and Jeff Johns is an incredible writer. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Ashley? We'll start with you. I am super excited for this movie. Wonder Woman was my favorite part of Batman v Superman. I think it is cool that we have an Israeli woman who is leading the most powerful female character of all time. This is a classic Wonder Woman origin story. They haven't implied in the breakdown whether or not it is going to go more New 52 or post-crisis, right. whether we're going demigod or piece of clay. I'm hoping for demigod personally. Piece uh, of clay is out, but my, me personally. Go on. Um, but I was going to say that I think that whatever they release at Comic-Con, whether it is a five-minute trailer, a two-minute trailer, whether we see a whole piece of a scene, it's going to be the coolest thing that DC is going to do, barring them screening the Suicide Squad for everyone. I agree. John, what do you think? Um, it, it's it's interesting. I'll be honest with you. I, I was relieved to hear Fuchs was out because when I was not comfortable with that guy being the writer for it. I'm also not comfortable with, man, it must have been that bad of a shape for a last minute page one rewrite. I, and I'm still not comfortable that even though it's Jeff Johns, dude only had maybe a month to right. put that thing together. No matter how good you are, that's that's operating under it's the rough. gun. It's, it's a little bit concerning. But at the same time, they seem to find their stride pretty fast. They didn't put the film off, so they must have felt they were on course to do it. As far as the story, 
It's classic. I mean, it's classic. I mean, we saw in the Wonder Woman DC animated film, they followed the same tropes, you know, uh, you know the pilot lands on the island. Here's the outside conflict. Goes to the outside world, and I'm glad they're doing that. I think that's the right approach to take. So look, they're gonna. I, I heard they're probably gonna go in and start some reshoots in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And please, nobody freak out when you hear that. That's standard operating procedure Every now. Movie. That's what they do. It's a part of their plan. They're making it better. Um, and they're they're just gonna make yeah. pick it up and make it a little bit better. Um, I'm look. I'm dying to see. I am so curious to see what flavor this movie's gonna have, what tone is it gonna have, and actually see some stuff in context yeah. and how it's gonna play out, I think then we can start developing our anticipation levels. At this point, it's just theory. Right. After Comic-Con, we're gonna actually have something to My hold My anticipation on to. is through the roof. From that, the little featurette that they showed, like so when cool. Kevin Smith and Jeff Johns were like giving little flavor nuggets and mm -hmm. stuff, and then they showed some of that footage, it was like, wow, that is dynamite, and they were like taking a page out of Captain America, don't be afraid about going into the past, there's a lot of amazing stories that happen, and, and in fact, Captain America and Wonder Woman happened in the 40s, so why not mine that? Also, I'm excited to see Zeus and Ares and some of these other characters be introduced because DC to me has always been the Greek gods, mm -hmm. the pantheon of Greek gods, and in to introduce them in a way that like kind of takes it out of like kind of the quasi-religious element and brings it more into the super science element, just like Thor and Asgard. I think that's how they're doing new gods with the mother box, and I think Zeus will be you know, fixed in and somewhat, somewhat like that. It'll be it described a little bit better. How about you, Robert? I can't wait for this movie. I mean, I think the World War One milieu was ballsy, mm. and it's like, wow, World War One. I? I mean, you don't have the technology they had in World War Two, right? So, and the idea, if Jeff Johns is writing this, it excites me that Jeff Johns is writing these projects as opposed to shepherding them the way Kevin Feige does. Totally, because what he'll do is he'll make sure that if the Amazons have a mother box. There'll be references to the new gods, and there'll be references to Dark Side mm -hmm. somehow yep. in this movie. Doesn't uh, the Justice League breakdown say that there's a mother box on Thymoscura? There is, and yeah. also the Atlanteans, yeah. Thymoscura, and and, and, and Cyborg right. is a mother box. And so, so. it's going to be interesting to see. Does that play in? Are we going to get a sense? Are we going to get any apocalypse? You know. Hey. Flavor in there, and to some, some of the fans who were about worried about the Zack Snyder thing, I forgot to mention this about the Zack Snyder rant story. Mm -hmm. Remember this: the, it's Zack Snyder actually comes up with some pretty great stories. Coming up with a story and then telling the story are two different pieces. Mm -hmm. Go to the Star Wars prequels for a second. The story of the Star Wars prequels, which George Lucas came up with, if you read them on a, just a two-page synopsis, the story of the Star Wars sequels or prequels are actually pretty damn good stories. Then there's the second phase, which is now telling the stories. I think Zack Snyder can come up with some really good stories, and then they put it into Jeff John's hands and the other writer as well, saying, now tell this story. Mm. So don't worry about it. I, I think that's not going to be a problem. Yeah, super excited to see any new footage for Wonder Woman. Let's get into minor mutations. This week, we are going to rock and roll and talk about, number one, the first close-up of Spidey and his web shooters showed up on Holland's Instagram, and then literally a cavalcade of photos of him, like, <laughs> taking out dudes, holding bikes, doing all kinds of stuff as Spider-Man in his new outfit. I thought it looks great. It's really exciting to see Spider-Man doing stuff, and it's not a CG character. It's actually a dude in a suit, and it looks cool. So number two, we got Colin Firth. He's alive! On the set of the Kingsman 2, what's going on? Is he a clone? I think he's a data, you know, processed, uh, you know, thing that he digitally recorded a bunch of stuff. That's what my hopes. Number three, dope star Kiersey Clemens is cast in the Flash movie. We don't know who she's going to play yet, but... She's in the movie, which is really exciting because she was awesome and dope. Number four, we got a giant Asgardian set being built in Australia for Thor Ragnarok. Will Thor wield Stormbreaker? We'll talk about Stormbreaker a little bit later, as well as Mark Ruffalo's crazy Instagrams. Uh, number five, we've got Escape from New York and Big Trouble in Little China crossover from Boom Studios. That's right, Kurt Russell versus Kurt Russell in comic <laughs> books. It's amazing. Number six, we got John Barrowman. He's gonna be a regular in all of the CWDC shows. He's all four of them, he's gonna be in it. Who is he playing? Is he Time Master? Who is he? I don't know yet. If anybody on the panel knows, tell us who he is. Uh, number seven, we got female Iron Man is debuting in the Marvel Comics now. They've got a whole bunch of comics that just dropped actually today, and this is one of them where uh, the a female taking over the role of Iron Man. So sounds exciting. Uh, number eight, we've got Tom Rothman talking about Spider-Man Homecoming. Uh, yes, indeed, 
it's a dance. And a lot of us were guessing that the homecoming will be a dance. Uh, he just ruined it. Thanks a lot, Tom Rothman. You spoiler. <laughs> um, and also we'll talk a little bit about the excitement of having Iron Man being there as kind of shepherding through Spider-Man and getting his, his suits done and all that kind of stuff. So let's uh, what what pops off to any of you? Who wants to talk about what? Well, John John Barrowman, first of all, he's already a regular in, in the CW universe. Okay. He's been from uh, Arrow. He was the big villain in Arrow season one. Okay. Then he becomes a quasi-villain, quasi... Is he Slash relative? Hero? He's a relative. <laughs> so what happens is he's the Dark Archer in the first one. He's a significant character's father. A couple of, You find out later, a couple significant character's fathers. And later on, after Raja al Ghul gets defeated, he becomes the new Raja al Ghul in the League okay. of Assassins. So in, in this world, he is... He's he's Rachel Al Ghul. That's Wait a second. So he went into the Lazarus pit. Uh, no, 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 it's no. A, he was part a of the League of Assassins. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I haven't Rachel checked Ghul, out Arrow yet. In, so in in the CW universe, Rachel Ghul is actually a title. Okay. And when Arrow defeated the last Al Ghul, the Australian one. Yes. <laughs> then then uh, he went back because he was a part of the League of Assassins earlier in his life he went back to it he was his nickname in the league i believe was the magician yes and he went back and he became the new leader leader of the league of assassins so that's who he is that's who he'll play i think it's very interesting and good because he is the strongest part of every every episode of arrow he's in he usually steals a scene he's such a great actor so i'm really happy to hear about this it'll be interesting to hear and it suggests to us that these four shows aren't only existing in the same universe, they're going to tie them together. They're going to have a running thread. Could that be awesome for continuity's sake? Or could it be like some comic book reader's frustrations when it's like, wait a minute, to get this whole story, I have to buy 18 different titles. Uh -huh. So will it be a cool thing or right. a frustrating thing? We'll have to wait and see, but I think it's a very interesting development. Those are really good points. I mean, I just think of him as Captain Jack from Doctor Who, like, you know, yeah. and Torchwood. So it's sort of like, that's where I, I was introduced to the actor uh, Barrowman. He's fantastic. So I haven't watched Arrow. I didn't even realize he was in Arrow. So, so you're expe one expecting villain, him yep. to go through the CW universe kissing all the men. Right. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just expecting, I was expecting him to play some other character. So I'm, I'm excited. I'll, I might be fucking catching up on Arrow very soon. Uh, it's four seasons now, but not the fifth season's popping off soon. Robert, what are your thoughts? Well, first of all, I'm pretty straight but I have a total man crush on John Barrowman. Mm -hmm. The more John Barrowman you can get is fine with me. Right on. I love John Barrowman. If you ever watch uh, the five episode Torchwood miniseries, Children of Earth. It is one of the best science fiction. It's one of the best science fiction shows ever. ever. And agree. if you've watched the Torchwood series. Say it again, what's were, it called? Torchwood Children of Earth. Children of Earth, check it out. It is one it's of, amazing. Can somebody who has never watched yes, Torchwood just yes. pick up that five yes, episode yes. thing and watch it? It works had, as a standalone nice. and it's I incredible. I have never watched Torchwood before. As a matter of fact, uh, I'd heard about Torchwood. I knew I knew Captain Jack because I'd seen him on Doctor Who, but I hadn't sure. watched Torchwood. One night, I got the Children of Earth miniseries, and it was like one in the morning. I put it on. I watched all five hours. I had to go to work at like nine. I know. <laughs> it, it, no, you can't not it's, watch all five. It's so good. Like it's, it's not just kind of good. You can't good. just watch 13, it's 13 awesome. I gotta watch it. it you'll, you'll <laughs> love I never even heard of it. What's What's so great about it? It's on Amazon. Is the threat is, is so dire, and when oh, you find out what's really going on, it's horrifying. It's evil. It's like horrifying. it's just horrifying. Okay, don't don't tell me anymore. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> you will get chills when you get. I also want to talk about the the female Iron Man, the young Iron Man. First of all, I have a crush on her, right. even though she's not real and she's way too young for me. <laughs> but I love the premise of it. I love that she's like this scientific genius, this young She prodigy. built a suit in her dorm room. Right, she built yep. a suit. And I think that's so cool Like, I, because she's got a lot of what Tony Stark probably sees a lot of himself in what she is. And I like the idea that someone in their dorm room is dabbling in super science. Mm -hmm. Like I wanted <laughs> to believe that that's what's happening with all of our youth. Rather than looking at their phones, they're actually building something. Have you recently something. been to a dorm room, though? <laughs> <laughs> right. Dabbling in super science, it could be code for something else. Yeah, I know. I want real super science. <laughs> Well, you know what? Who else is dabbling? Like in the beginning of War of the Worlds, super science. I want to see You got it. Peter Parker is dabbling in super science, and that's why Tony Stark uh, seeks him out in the cinematic universe. Well, I'm hoping you that can all the youth of America will stop playing Pokemon Go and dabble in super <laughs> science. I'm trying to say that they could e make an easy pathway to this version of a cinematic Iron Man as this character. Because oh, yeah. they've, already, be cool. they've already established it with, with Spider-Man. So uh, what, are, what pops off to you? Uh, it's funny. I actually wanted to talk about Spider-Man. I think that all this news that's coming out about the movie and the way they're releasing it to me seems very reactionary to the criticisms from Civil War and and I said this and I know a lot of people have said this that Spider-Man looks super rubbery at parts in Civil mm. War because he's a CG animated character and I think it's so interesting that they're like no 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 Instagram 
he's really doing it. Mm. He's a, he's that Billy Elliot kid. He can do all this stuff. How neat is that? Right. And it looks amazing. And I think that allowing Tom Holland as the face of the brand to release that makes it way more accessible and way friendlier when we weren't such a big fan of the last cinematic Spider-Man and the homecoming dance. I mean, that's that's cute, right? Yeah. Dancing's cute. I think we all <laughs> kind of guessed that there was going to be some dance involved when it was called homecoming. It'd be like, that's a weird title if they don't have some, the homecoming dance. But is he going something. with Mary Jane or is he going with Gwen? We'll dun, have dun, to dun, wait dun. to find out. I wanted to talk about Colin Firth reappearing after he got his brains blown out in The Kingsman. So he got better. Of, yeah, he got better. He he, uh, he went to Tahiti. It's yeah, he was in the hospital for a little there, bit. Uh, yeah, no so, so a little bandage. Got scooped the brains up. Um, yeah, my thoughts are it's not a clone. It better not be a clone. Don't make it a clone. That would suck if it was a clone. My hope <laughs> is that you know, the reports of my death are like, you know, greatly exaggerated. greatly exaggerated, but he's saying that from a video where he's digitally recorded hours and hours and hours of training and all of his knowledge, hopefully to give it to someone he doesn't know who, but it's all a database storage thing. So that, to me personally, would be the greatest way to be able to get Colin Firth back into Kingsman and not ruin the movie by having a stupid clone or it's his brother, screw that. So you want it to be Jarrell? I want it to be Jarrell, or I mentioned earlier, Dr. Oblivion from Videodrome. Come go. on, yo, I'm pulling back the old school deep cuts. All right, let's move on. We got a flashback. It's, a, it's one of your favorite movies this week. We're gonna talk, it's about the Green Lantern movie from 2011. That's right. Yes. Before Ryan Reynolds owned the box office with his R-rated realization of Deadpool, he swung for the other team. That being DC Comics' big budget adaptation of Green Lantern. Written by TV superstar, now, Greg Berlanti and three other screenwriters, it was directed with spotty confusion by Martin Campbell. This movie soars when it's on the planet Oa as Hal Jordan learns about what it is to be part of the galaxy's police force called the Green Lantern Corps. If I said Oa wrong, someone please correct me. Uh, these scenes with Mark Strong as his mentor, Sinestro, all work great and were actually fun and exciting to watch. Uh, that's where it ends for me as the rest of the film plops along with a giant headed David Lynchian screamo super freak villain named Hector Hammond played with sweaty moaning delight by Peter Skarsgård who eventually summons a giant alien poop cloud with that attacks Earth just like Galactus but brown cloud poo instead of purple cloud swirls and Green Lantern uses a bunch of different clear green earth weapons formed from his power ring to fight this cloud called Parallax. The entire design for the Green Lantern core and Green Lantern himself probably look great on paper but the striated exposed muscle suits were glossy, sparkly, strangely fake, uh, and, and straight up they looked dumb, okay? I'm glad Ryan met his future wife, Blake Lively, who played Carol Ferris, and they both had great chemistry in the few scenes that they actually had together, but this movie just sucked. Let's talk about this weird, wildly uneven Green Lantern film. All right. Let's must, start with- Must we? <laughs> let's, we must for a moment. Let's talk about it. John, uh, let's start with you, Robert. I liked it. Kind of. Okay. Now, I didn't know how they were going to pull off. I thought Ryan Reynolds was actually good as Green Lantern. I think this movie's big, short. And Martin Campbell, of course, directed two James Bond movies. He directed right. Golden Eye, bringing back Pierce Brosnan. Which was great. Which was great. And then he also came back and he did Quantum. Casino Royale. Oh, no, no, I thought he did. No, he did Casino Royale, oh. bringing, bringing a new Bond. Yeah, he launched in, two, two Bonds. Yeah, bringing, bringing the new Bond wow. into the, bringing Daniel Well, he did Craig a great in. job And he those. also directed movies like No Escape. And he's done some great work. I think this film is torpedoed, once again, as so many comic book films are, by these wildly sh shifting tones. Mm. One movie, one minute the movie's slapstick, yep. and the next minute you're on Oa, and it's this cosmic odyssey that was right. actually, I, I mean, I liked how it began, the whole idea of he's a test pilot, you know, like how Jordan mm -hmm. was, and he's fighting these drones, and he works for Ferris Aircraft, and all of that. That was all cool, and um, everything worked well until they brought in this goofy, villain yeah and they always torpedo these movies with it was like what happened with um spider-man 2 amazing spider-man 2 i mean who who wants to see these i don't want goofy villains right. i want villains that are scary yeah. every villain should pass the hans gruber test ah. smart and dangerous that's right not goofy and like dude like playing like goofball music while he's walking with my, my mean, papers my papers i don't understand you know? <laughs> if you have a villain named electro your right. job is to make electro believable and scary that's right. That's what. That's what. And in this movie, Hector Hammond, 
I like Peter Skarsgård as an actor, but what movie is he in? He is in like a weird, creepy uh, monster film where he's sweating and screaming at night. And even the shots where he's in bed with his head growing, you're like, what am I watching? Right, That's but paradox. he also seems like it's the kind of movie where he's making only $1,000 for the whole shoot. <laughs> <laughs> and the movie was hampered by all being shot in New Orleans. Uh, you know, the other thing I got to say is that it was also hampered by those weird suits. I think Martin Campbell himself is, had expressed like, hey, look, I, I got in on this film and then the, we just started rolling. The script wasn't even done. We're trying to figure what's going on, you know, because they were rewriting as they were going a little bit. And then the designs on the suits were sort of just I think they were almost last minute. That's what it feels like to me. I could be wrong, but they well, didn't the suits work. Look good. It's just this idea to see, have them CG creations and not real goofy it was weird i yeah. mean you know they're not real yeah. so you're looking at something and you're like is this animated what is this why and again it, it shatters the verisimilitude of the, the the whole shebang john how about you i, I thought th i didn't mind the animated uh, outfits to be honest with because when you think about what the green lantern is and who they are i think spandex would have looked odd Understanding what the, I just think it would have looked odd, I, and I like the fact that they are they are powered by cosmic energy in mm -hmm. a sense, right? That so I thought that was fine. I didn't hate Green Lantern. I didn't. Either. But Green Lantern was a poor film. It was a bad film. It was a disappointment. And I think what compounded the disappointment was the fact that it starts off pretty good. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like I actually thought. Reynolds at the time was not a bad Hal Jordan. No, he was I good. I actually thought it was a pretty damn good Hal Jordan. I love the stuff on Oa. I thought Mark Strong as Sinestro. They should bring been, him back. Just don't bring him back in a post credit scene where he discovers a yellow ring. I've got ring. the yellow ring for oh, no reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you're right. Where this movie really gets derailed is with the whole... First of all, Hector never worked even before he became the large-headed Sneezo. Right. Like, it, even before <laughs> that happened, he wasn't working as a character at all. Right. And then that first big demonstration of his power when he creates the uh, the hot toys kind of loop-de-loop -loop car thing. Yeah, it's like, the, okay, yeah, no, 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 don't do that. Yeah, it was hot, hot Wheels. Hot Wheels. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the thing was, that's what makes the movie even more disappointing was that it started off and you could see the promise and then as the movie progressed, you could see them squander that promise and what really made Made me mad because like one probably my top seven or eight favorite storylines of all time in comics was the whole Hal Jordan parallax thing mm. mm -hmm. like the original one when you realize when you find out who parallax is and all that kind of stuff and I thought when they first said parallax is going to be in this movie I'm like holy sh shit they're going there already like, this could be dramatically awesome and then they t made him an alien from Mars attacks floaty head with squiddy tentacles going bleh yeah. like, <laughs> I, and you just saw you saw it happening before your eyes this movie was so much promise and started up bad slowly after the 30 minute mark mm. start to decline and decline and decline and it's, it's just too bad see I agree with both of you but that's why I, I, I really don't like it because it had oh, so much like premise <laughs> uh, the, the beginning had so much promise and then once we're at oh I was like you know this is actually working and then it derails itself so quickly. and becomes an uneven weird swirly mess with a poo, poo cloud at the end so I end up hating it because it had so much awesomeness in it that it made me not like it more than just a lame movie so what are your thoughts I don't know if I can offer any more valid criticism than what we've already heard but Taika Waititi as the best friend whose name I don't even remember in this <laughs> movie is really funny so like watch his clip and then go see Hunt for the Wilder People because that's a better cinematic experience nice um, and also I will say that the writing of the character in here for me feels a lot like Kyle Rayner and a lot less like Hal Jordan mm. a lot of the time. That's You're right. Good, totally good, true. Good point. That's totally that's true. That's actually more Ryan Reynolds' speed, and I'm glad that he's Deadpool. That's oh, like he sure. was born to Absolutely. play Deadpool. Yes. I'm glad. If anything that happened that made Green Lantern fail, that made him actually be able to do Deadpool, then we could thank that. More for power Green to it. Thank you, Green <laughs> Lantern. You know, I, I mean, one last thing: the design of Oa, the design of the Guardians, mm. the design of all of that was really cool. Oh, it was well I thought the done. Guardians yeah. were really well done. Yep. I thought I liked their strange, weird things that they sat on. And Everything like about like, 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 it. And, too. Like, and Michael Clark dicks. Duncan like, <laughs> yeah. killed yeah. it. He so was a good. Kilowatt. So good. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jeffrey Rush as a... Uh, uh, the weird the, bird dude. The Tomar too. Thank you. Thank you. He was great. <laughs> Great. That's what I mean. If the whole movie was set on Oa, which is like, hopefully we're hearing about Green Lantern Corps. Then they would have brought the poop cloud to Oa. Oh, God. Oh, God. It's still You're right. right. You're right. All right. Well, let's just, let's just pretend. Well, no, we don't have to pretend. We've, we're getting a Green Lantern Corps. We've heard it's a buddy cop movie. We know part of it's on Earth. Really, guys? Make sure it's most of it's set in outer space. Mm -hmm. DC, this is your Guardians of the Galaxy. I don't need to yell at you and tell you you don't have to have it on Earth. It should be in outer space almost the entire time. We don't need an origin story. Have Hal Jordan. He's already got the ring. You got to recast it. We're all smart people. We're all on board. Just do it.
Next, we got Spotlight, Beta Ray Bill. That's right, I got Beta Ray Bill coming at you, son. Look at that drawing on the left-hand side right there is from Walt Simonson, the king granddaddy of some of the best written Thor comic books you can ever read if it's not coming from Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Pick up Walt Simonson's entire Thor run. The spotlight this week is on Beta Ray Bill, the genetically modified warrior alien that defeated Thor in combat and was given all of Thor's powers and his enchanted hammer from Odin himself. Eventually, Thor and Beta Ray Bill they teamed up to stop Surtur and his transdimensional demon horde from destroying the world, the universe, and everything around it. And he was given a special new hammer, Beta Ray Bill was, forged by the trolls, and it's named Stormbreaker. He eventually got romantically involved with Sif. Could the ballad of Beta Ray Bill work in a television series or a feature film? Now, before we get into that, I wanted to say the reason I brought up Stormbreaker in the first place is because there was an Instagram that Chris Hemsworth posted yeah. <laughs> holding a hammer, just a regular hammer. Now, for those of you who don't know anything about comic books, that hammer looks like Stormbreaker. Stormbreaker looks just like a hammer. It's giant, it's golden. And what we keep hearing is Hela and Loki team up to take away Thor's enchanted meow meow. So it gets taken away. Now, who possibly gets his hammer and then could lead well, to something can, a little bit? Who can lift like, it? Who can lift it? Captain America. Captain America yeah. can the almost vision. get it. The vision can pretty much do like throw around throw it around can beta ray build is he worthy to hold it so i think beta ray bill is one of my favorite characters he's a really cool redesign of thor it actually was when thor was like no one was buying thor and then simonson was like give me thor and he basically retconned it similar to how alan moore had retconned swamp thing he took everything that you knew about thor and just flipped it and he was like man it was so exciting to read that so if you haven't read it do yourself a giant favor and read that story. It's amazing and so much fun. Channeling Kirby, channeling Stan Lee. I wanna see that story put to the screen or television series in some way. I could see Beta Ray Bill possibly fitting in, if not on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. because they've had Sif in that in some way, shape or form. Is it me just begging to see Beta Ray Bill? <laughs> what are your thoughts? Robert, let's start with you. Well, I mean, I think if this truly is, if they're using a lot of these, <laughs> elements in in thor ragnarok i can see us seeing beta ray bill mm -hmm. in thor ragnarok i mean why not right you know he what a great place to introduce him and carry him on maybe he's in guardians of the galaxy maybe right. he can be in infinity war i loved beta ray bill because it was what got me reading thor comics again i wasn't interested in thor comics but then they made him this cool alien and right. i'm like oh okay you know I'll who, go back. Who, who had heart and cared he right. sacrificed himself to save his entire world right and that's why i love i love that character because when i got back into reading comics when i was a wee lad i was only reading i promised myself i'm only gonna read sci-fi comics <laughs> i'm only gonna read alien legion or things like twisted tales or things like that but that quickly fell by the wayside right. i mean that lasted about a week at the comic book store you know, but Beta Ray Bill was something I got really into, and it really brought me into reading Thor. So, so what do you I would think? Love to see series or feature film? If they're well, going, no, he's going to be in the feature films. I, I, as a matter of fact, I'll bet that we're going to see Beta Ray Bill in Thor Ragnarok. Nice. I'll bet we will. Campia, what do you think? Um, cannot work as a television series for, for for two reasons. One, just because of look at him, who and what he is. I, I don't think you can carry that on week to week. And he's he's Thor level god like power. So I, I don't know how you could do that. Plus, but here's the main reason I thought you did do a TV series with him. He, you don't, you just don't think of Beta Ray Bill without your very next thought being Thor. I, I mean, they're so connected in, in most fans' minds that I find it very, very, it's a, it's a treat. It's like doing a Joker television series, but you can never have Batman. Right. You know, it, it just, well, they did, they're doing a Batman oh, series where you can't have Batman. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, yes. <laughs> I mean, they have done that. So I, I agree with Robert on this. I think if not a full out character in Ragnarok, I think there's at least going to be a reference. Look, or a since nod, the something. day one that they announced that they were gonna do a Thor movie, everybody has buzzed. Oh my God, I hope they have Beta Ray Bill. It's time. Right. It, they, they have waited long enough. And it's our Lord time and Savior, to Kevin Feige, knows. He knows this. <laughs> he knows. He knows. Yeah. He knows this. He knows. And if it's not going to be Thor, whatever, they don't call him Thor 3, it's Thor Ragnarok. Is there going to be a fourth Thor? Or is there some way that if they introduce Beta Ray Bill in this Thor Ragnarok that he does carry over into Avengers 1 and 2, whatever those are going to be called, and then possibly you know, the further adventures of the secret Avengers or whatever they end up is. Will he be a team member? I agree with you. He works, the, he worked in the comic books when he took over as Thor, but it was only like four or five issues. Thor was bumming out. Donald Blake doesn't exist anymore. All this other weird hey, stuff Donald is going Blake. on. Yeah. So I mean, you know, <laughs> Hey, what's with the cane? Let's just not even talk about that anymore. <laughs> it's out the window. So, I mean, you know, Thor eventually came back, got back in the 
good graces of his of Odin. That's why so, you know Beta Ray Bill got his own you know hammer. So it's like that kind of stuff would be great to see. But I agree with you. I'd like to see it with Thor. What are your thoughts, Ashley? I know a lot of people think that we've already seen Beta Ray Bill in the collector's uh, yeah. collection because right. you do see the guy with the red cape who has his back to you. Mm -hmm. I think Guardians would be a really appropriate place to introduce him where he wouldn't be super weird. I think in That's Ragnarok true. he's going to really stand out because he's really scary right uh but i think that if you do beta ray bill then you open the door to lady thor and throg and that's what i'm really holding out for you want to see a frog thor i do that's i could see the the post credit sequence in guardians being about beta ray bill oh that would be so that dope. would lead just think right about what star lord would say to him it'll be good it'll yeah be good. <laughs> uh, I, lo I love that and james gunn is you know a sweaty nerd you know he's like <laughs> talking about rom all the time nobody knows what rom is but he does so he knows who Beta Ray Bill is. And if anyone's going to bring him in to the horde of weirdos like Guardians of the Galaxy, everyone's going to accept it. It'll be awesome. Let's get in there to Twitter questions, yo. Here we go. Native Cun asks, if Doctor Strange does well at the box office, could you see DC following it up by announcing a Doctor Fate movie? So this is the mystical version of Doctor Strange. It's Doctor Fate. He's been actually around longer than Doctor mm -hmm. Strange. But could they actually pop that off? What do you think, Ashley? I think they could. I think if they're going to do Dr. Fate, it's not going to be reactionary because none of their movies, to me, the way they're slated out, feels reactionary to Marvel. If they do, I think they should do the new, cool uh, Middle Eastern Dr. Fate, mm. and that would open up the diversity of their line that Marvel doesn't have right now. like that idea. What do you think, John? Uh, I think if Doctor Strange comes out and it crashes and burns, DC at some point will still do Doctor Fate. Look, they've been <laughs> they've been using Doctor Fate in their tell. They've been yep. hinting mm -hmm. and teasing and outright having Doctor Fate there. They've been using him in almost every story medium that they have. Mm -hmm. DC loves Doctor Fate. He was in Smallville. Yes, yes. he was in Smallville His, too. And Helmets and Constantine. Yep. yep. Yeah. Yeah. At yeah. some point, believe me, they're going to make a Doctor Fate movie. Yeah. Like w regardless of how, I completely agree with what Ashley's saying. It's going to be completely divorced from how good Doctor Strange does, and that'll have nothing. To to do with it if Doctor Strange is a great success that'll make DC feel better about Doctor Fate but even <laughs> if it crashes and burns I guarantee you at some point the next seven years you're gonna see a Doctor Fate film yeah or if not even like in Justice League or like they bring him in Justice yeah, League Dark be, or something he'll be introduced be part of that Robert well, I mean, I think Justice League, even when I was a kid, I lived for the Earth 1, Earth 2 crossovers that happened every year. <laughs> and Dr. Fate was my favorite Earth 2 character. Mm -hmm. I mean, I loved the Justice Society, and I love his costume. I just want to see Dr. Fate. You know, on TV in Smallville, it was, was kind of cool. Right. But I think it needs the design work. It needs a feature film to really showcase and make Dr. Fate cool. I don't know if he'd work well as a standalone movie. They've had problems with their Dr. Fate comics. Mm -hmm. You read them, they're always... You know, I did like when um, Sean McManus was drawing Dr. Fate, mm -hmm. where he draw, he drew the mask as sort of almost organic. Mm -hmm. I thought that was great. But it's a tough. that's a tough character to make work in his own film. I agree. Or her own film. Yeah. Because Dr. Fate has also been a He's a complimentary character. Uh, Sexy Infidel asks, What are the chances that Granny Goodness shows up in the DCEU? I say highly likely. I don't think they're going to introduce Granny Goodness or Lashina or any other other of the kind of extreme versions of the New Gods uh, in uh, Justice League. But we are going to see Steppenwolf. I think we're going to probably see Desaad, who is the you know Dark Side's little you know creepy uh, you know Renfield, if you want to say. Could get Orion even. You could yeah, get, get Orion. Orion. I would love to see Orion. I would love to see Big Barda and Mister Miracle. But if you introduce Big Barda and Mister Miracle, that goes hand in hand with Granny Goodness, who ran those camps. She's a character that even if she even had two lines, but you gotta. It's sort of this 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 line that we're going to be riding right now for at least the next year and a half, where we already understand any of, any of us sweaties who've read the DC comics and understand what mother boxes are know that we have just entered the world of the new gods. And how far are we going to go with Just League? Well, Just League feels like we also have to introduce the Amazons and the Atlanteans and the war between them and the mother boxes. So that feels to me will be a bigger part of of the story and we're probably going to get ocean master and some of the the villains of both the amazons like Ares and ocean master for for aquaman you know mucking stuff up and joining forces or whatever so we create this big kind of battle sequence for just league but also it's kind of uh, organic and works and you don't have to cram all these other new gods in there but you got to have a couple of them i don't think you're going to see granny goodness if so we'll see her in just league too but what do you think, John? Um, Granny Goodness is another character that was used by 
DC in their CW stuff. I mean, we that's saw right. Granny Goodness that's in right. Smallville, that's right. but I don't know that Granny Goodness would fit into the worldview Zack Snyder has. I, I just don't know. And so I I think it's a coin toss. I honestly mm. do. Because part of me is like, yeah, you got to use Granny Goodness. But at the same time, I don't know that Zack Snyder would feel that way. So to me, it's a coin toss. I just don't know. It's also really how they write it. Because yes, the, the way Kirby mm-hmm. has come up with all these names, like you just say, I hope Granny Goodness is in that. And you like half laugh because it's such a goofy name. Yep. But the way he names everything has these kind of big epic overtones to it. So Granny Goodness is actually, she's pure evil. Oh, so. yeah, yeah. What are your thoughts, Robert? Well, I find it really interesting. You've got the Kryptonians, the Atlanteans, and uh, the Amazons. They've got the Amazons and the Crypt, uh, the Atlanteans have mother boxes, so they have ties to Apocalypse mm-hmm. and New Genesis somehow. Yes, and his high father Zeus. Yes, you know, I mean, I all think. of these things—they're going to have to tie all this in together. And if they do, which by the way I think is cool, because I was wondering, are the Amazonians and the Atlanteans Kryptonian mm-hmm. ancestors? Probably not. I bet they're more likely somewhere from the new gods world. All father, high father could be like, some call me Zeus. Right. You know? I mean, why not? That's all. You, it's just like Apocalypse. Yep. Yahweh. You know, yeah. all those things. And I, I, I look, if Helen Mirren plays Granny Goodness, I said Gr- Gwendolyn Christie for Big Barda, but I want to see Helen Mirren play Granny Goodness. I'd love to see that. <laughs> that would be I, actually yes. pretty <laughs> awesome. The answer to the question is yes. I do think we're going to see. All right, let's. Does every, everybody weigh in? I think we got everybody. Let me go on to the next one. Dan S asks, "Who are comic artists that most people might not know, but should?" For me, it's Alex Toth and Travis Cherist. So, Dan S, that's a great question. I think most people know who Alex Toth is because yeah. all of his covers you still see on the wall at comic shops as the expensive things to invest in, and he designed a lot of the classic Hanna Barbera cartoons that are coming back in like Vogue Space right Ghost, now. yeah, exactly. Space Ghost, Hercules, a whole bunch of them. Um, boy, that's a that's a let, let me just go off a couple right away. Uh, definitely Bill Sinkevich. We've had him as a guest here on our show, Heroes. He is an artist like no one else. He's got a unique style. It's amazing. It's uh, beautiful. Uh, check out his New Mutants run for sure. Um, who pops off to you? Well, I was going to say Sean McManus. Is I hadn't thought about Sean McManus for years and years, but he first started, I, I caught up with him when he took over on Omega Men uh, mm. back in the day. And I, I loved his work, and I loved his work on, on Dr. Fate. But I'll tell you something. He, you hear about him, but I'm a huge fan of Howard Chaikin's work. Oh, yeah, as Howard Chaikin. His panel designs and his work. If you guys want to read a great comic, read the first American Flag 1 through 12. Those comics were so groundbreaking in so many ways. And you'll notice, you'll recognize a lot of that now because so much of it has been co-opted. He got a credit in RoboCop Mm -hmm. because a lot of what was in RoboCop, Mm -hmm. especially the commercial breaks and things, were really taken right out out of his work. But I love Chaykin. Yeah, let's uh, I'll name off a couple more. Steve Rude, uh, Walt Simons, who I mentioned earlier for Thor, has got an incredible graphic design sensibility. George Perez, who's you know the father of you know a lot of like team books, he's done incredible runs on Teen Titans, Avengers. He's done runs on almost everybody's drawn everyone. I have a personal soft spot for a lot of John Byrne work. Uh, what are your thoughts? Um, I would say Howard Porter because he did a really really great run on JLA uh, mm-hmm. with Grant Morrison really and Mark good. Wade, and he's drawing Scooby Apocalypse right now. His style has changed because he had an accident Mm -hmm. Uh, but both his style before and after is really amazing it's some of the most kinetic art that's out there and um, Nicholas Scott who is drawing the Wonder Woman Earth 1 side draws the sexiest men in comic books I'm gonna also (laughs) chuck in Mike Allred who's like as well as the creator of Mad Men just has been having so much fun doing all kinds of stuff he's doing Silver Surfer right now love his artwork how about you John who pops off to you there's an artist by the name of Brian I always wonder if I'm pronouncing it uh, Brian Stolfries yes oh he's amazing I first got introduced to his work actually in there's this little run called Day Men. Right. It actually got picked up a move for a movie option. Oh yeah. As a matter of fact, nice. my friend uh, Matt Yagnon uh, wrote it. It's from Boom. Oh yeah. yeah, that's right. And it's it's just part of the art just flows with the story so well. And he has a way of making his art. And if you look at the different stuff he does, his his style almost changes very subtly from story to story to blend in with the story a little bit better. It's really quite nice. So that would be the name that comes to my head. Of course, I'll, I'll also throw in Darwin Cook. He recently passed away, but definitely check out his art. It's got a, a beautiful throwback to some of the old styles. Also has a Bruce Tim flavor to it, but it's very beautiful and lush and, you know and just else? flows. Mike Grell. I was a big Mike Grell fan. He did the long, the Green oh, Arrow sure. Longbow Hunter yeah. series, but I loved his series. Warlord. Warlord. That was great. That DC series. John Sable Freelance. Mm-hmm. I love that. That was a first comic, same time mm-hmm. that American Flag was coming 
coming out. That's a, these are all great lists. You know, we'll, we'll, sometime in the future, we're going to compile an incredible list of not only comic books for you to read, but writers and artists for you to check out. Nice. So it's a great question. Let's move on. We got two more questions to go. We got Joseph Robert Fisher asks, could Marvel do a Suicide Squad movie with some lesser villains, anti-heroes in it? And who should they pick? So this would be a Marvel style Suicide Squad. I mean, that's what the Thunderbolts is. Exactly. Thank you <laughs> right. for mentioning the Thunderbolts. That is the Suicide Squad of Marvel. And they're currently being led by the Winter Soldier, who everybody on Tumblr thinks is really hot. So that would be a great way to introduce that team. I think, uh, you know, Ashley nailed it. Anybody else have anybody? I, Thunderbolts was <laughs> well, the I was answer. I say, yeah, that's the first thing that came yeah. to my mind. Mm, I wonder who the anti-villains of the Marvel is. Thunderbolts, just read it. It's Fabian Nicianza did a great run on it. Um, Anthony, let's get to the next question. Anthony D. Davis asks, will Marvel ever bring the Red Skull back to the MCU? Well, if he's going to have a chance to get brought back, it's going to be in this Infinity War, Super, whatever the hell it's going to be called. Double feature, shot in IMAX, freak zone, everybody's in it. So, so look at it like you got Thanos they're gonna Loki's gonna be in it they're gonna bring where has the Red Skull been hanging out what's he been doing he's somewhere on another dimension Hugo, John what do you Hugo think Hugo Weaving said he didn't want to come back it doesn't matter <laughs> he if he comes back he insisted he didn't want to come yeah. back yeah. I mean he, there's an interesting thing is that Hugo Weaving gave this one great interview once who, and he acknowledged if Marvel forces me to come back I have to come back mm -hmm. but they know I don't want to do it which I think is a damn shame because he is look everybody knows in the Marvel films the one knock on them is they don't develop their villains much and that's by design because Kevin Feige likes to keep all the attention on the heroes right. it works for them I get it but Red Skull is one of the very few, arguably only two villains that have really truly worked mm -hmm. in the in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. He was great. I would and they left him very ambiguous. Mm -hmm. At the end for him and Captain America was very ambiguous. He s seemed to fall into that same vortex that Loki fell into, and Loki's still around. You'd, I'd love to see them bring him back, but I always say actors are interchangeable, and they are. But I really want Hugo Weaving playing it. Yeah. So Marvel. Force Hugo Weaving to come. Sorry, Hugo. Love you. Back up. Force him to come back. Back up a truck of money. You got Sam Jackson yes. to do Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. You can get Hugo Weaving to come back to the cinematic You know universe. what? Yes. All you got to do is promise Hugo. It's like, look, we'll put a bunch of dots on your face and you don't have to wear you, the mask. Exactly. Because yeah. I'm Although sure that was. The mask looked great. The mask looked great, but I'm sure that was part of it where the, the, yes, the it was. application of like six to seven hours every that. day. It's a grueling task for any actor or actress who puts themselves through that. We have the technology now where you can just do your everything, put it all in the face, put those dots on, and then you got a skull doing it. You never had to wear that. So I would implore you go anybody who knows you go email and tell them to just put the dots on and rock that red skull what do you think robert well i was gonna say i just love the hugo weaving hot toys red skull figure because it has both a hugo weaving head and a red skull head all right oh, and it's very great nice. it's that great. is crazy i bet hugo has that one and it just has his head on it so here's the sweaty question of the week it comes from pablo and he asks what's your favorite comic-con memory so we are all going to be going to the nerd mecca comic-con next week uh, we're making our travels. It's not that far for us. It's just to San Diego. We're all here in Hollywood. So what are your thoughts? Ashley, what's your favorite memory that you have? Well, I've been to Comic-Con exactly once. So it will be from last year. Excuse me. Uh, I got to go to the WB party last year and talk to Jimmy Palmiotti and Amanda Connor in a very casual context. And that was like the coolest thing that's probably ever happened to me to date. Nice. Uh, so yeah, just chatting with two of the coolest people in comics. I think I have two ones that stuck out of my mind. One I kind of side mentioned was, uh, it was a couple like maybe five, six years ago and they previewed that little Tron trailer with them on the light bikes. I'm a big Tron head and I didn't even know anything about this. And I remember one of my friends was like, Outside, I didn't see it when they previewed it. People just buzzing. I was drunk at a party, and somebody's like, "Check it out!" It was on <laughs> on YouTube, and I was like, "Oh my god!" Just like jumping around, like excited that they're actually making a Tron movie, and never, you know, it's one of those like just came out of nowhere. Uh, the other memory for me is why I'm sitting here at this table right now. It's thanks to Morgan Spurlock because I met him at a party. Uh, and I was drunk and I was like, how come they've got lawyer shows at Comic-Con? This isn't about comics anymore. And I was kind of going off on a little tirade. Um, and he, well, I was talking to him because he liked Metalocalypse. So he was like, I want to meet that guy. So we just got into this conversation. Morgan's an awesome dude. And he was like, hey, man, I want you to be in my film, uh, episode four, com you know, A New Hope. So I'm in that movie. Uh, and I was like, I remember waking up the next day. I was like, I can't say all that stuff. I said, I'll kill my career. So I was like, <laughs> I didn't go off too hard on the, some of the stuff. But it was really fun. And that was an introduction to me starting to be a talking head and having my voice heard 
and I ended up doing a couple of spots for G4. And then a friend said, hey, there's this guy, John Campia. He's doing this AMC for your consideration show. And he's looking for a dude who knows about Guardians of the Galaxy. And you're a big nerd and you've read the comics. Come on the show. I met John. We did the show. And this is now it's over four years. We've been lovers ever We've since. We've been lovers ever since. But he kept on. He said, hey, man, come back anytime. It was really fun. I was like, dude, I love doing this. Um, I was directing uh, cartoon shows at the time, but kept making time to do this stuff. And it's become my second career. And I love doing it. So thanks, John Campia. Thank you, Comic-Con. It all comes together for <laughs> full circle. So that's my favorite memories. How about you, John? Uh, probably best favorite memory uh, stems from a certain 2 a.m. party that I cannot talk about on screen. But aside from that, the, my two favorite memories are, one, the first time I moderated a panel in Hall H. That was, that, was a, a, that was just a kick in the ass. That was nice. so much fun. I had a great time doing that. And be there, and you got 6,500 people packed in there, and you're all excited, and you're talking Comic-Con. That was cool. The other one was, I was throwing a party. This is going back about six or seven years. I was throwing a party at Comic-Con for this one actor who had a, a project coming out. And it was Milo Ventimiglia from, from sure. Heroes. So his buddies from Heroes decided to come to the party, and Zachary Quino, and I wish I thought about this in advance, I would have had a picture here for you to put up, but my fair memory is that Zachary Quino came to the party, and it was the day at Comic-Con that they had announced him as the new Mr. Spock. Wow. So he came, he was earlier, he was in Hall H, came out and introduced his new Spock, him and Leonard Nimoy, did the thing on stage, and then later that night he was at our party, and I got some great pictures of us with him, and that's the night that he was introduced to Spock, so those are my two favorite memories of nice. Comic-Con. Robert Meyerbernet. Uh, I think, as some people know, I've been doing, I was the founding member of, of the Starship Smackdown, which is the panel that pretty much ends Comic-Con every year. And basically, we are spaceshipologists and discuss our favorite spaceships. And a couple awesome. of years ago, a couple of years ago, it's a very goofy panel. Neil deGrasse Tyson was sitting in our audience. That's awesome. And I'm like, I'm a huge Neil deGrasse Tyson fan. I'm like, what is Neil deGrasse Tyson doing listening to this ridiculousness? Well, it comes up that the Starship Smackdown that year was a tie. It was the refit Enterprise the motion picture against the original Enterprise. And we call it out to the audience, like, which ship should win? Neil deGrasse Tyson, like, gets up and defends the original Starship Enterprise from the original series back from the 60s, my fetish object of all time. And I was, like, I was practically weeping because here's one of my great heroes defending the honor of the great Starship Enterprise. And my other favorite memory was I was covering uh, the making of Superman Returns. I was embedded with that production. He had come over to Comic-Con, and Brian was going somewhere, and he gave his limo to us. He gave his limo to me and one other guy, and Ashley Miller, who ended up writing Thor and X-Men First Class, who's been an old friend of mine. And Ashley impersonated Brian and got us all into a party. Nice. <laughs> and it was, and if you see Ashley Miller, ask him to do his Brian Singer uh, impression for you. But that was one of my. Those are all fantastic memories. memories. Uh, I hope to make more memories with everybody here. And uh, we'd love to see you at San Diego Comic Con. If you're coming down, definitely tweet us. We're going to have a meet and greet on Thursday. Uh, for all of our shows, including Film HQ, which John runs for the Comic Con HQ channel, uh, also Collider Movie Talk, Schmoes No, Collider Heroes, Jedi Council, we're all doing a meet and greet. It's going to be uh, well, John. Where is it again? We we haven't nailed it down. Okay, we haven't nailed it down yet. We will watch for our Twitter, watch for our yeah. social media feeds. Schnapp and I will push out where it's going to be. We have an idea where it's going to be. We just have to get the final okay to have it there. It's going to be a great space, though. Yeah, it'll be, we'll it's going to be a lot of fun. We know it's Thursday. We know it starts at six o'clock. Everything else is a uh, full disclosure coming i'd like to thank all the panelists starting with ashley where can we find you online uh, you can find me every monday through friday on comicbook.com's facebook page hosting comic book now you can follow me on twitter at ashley v robinson awesome robert meyer burnett where can we find you uh, online? you can find me on instagram at rm burnett or twitter burnett rm or facebook at robert meyer burnett and John Campia, where can we find you on you the interwebs? You can find me on Facebook and on Twitter. Follow me at John Campia. Of course, our show Film HQ on the new Comic-Con HQ network. And follow my podcast, the John Campia podcast, on your favorite podcast app or on video on my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash John Campia. Right on. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. Get my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, at tdoslwh.com. We just put out a brand new Blu-ray DVD combo pack for less money. It's there online. You can get it. You could rent it or you could buy it, own it. Um, and you can find me with all these people here at San Diego Comic-Con next week. It's going to be so much fun. We're doing a ton of panels. It's going to be a blast. And we're going to be doing a, a, hero, a special Heroes there live. Well, not live. I'm sorry. We're, we're going to record it there and get you in on all the news. So until next week, episode 66, you've been watching 65 and I'm out. Later. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. 
Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.